In this video, we show how Katherine Densford and the School of Nursing faculty responded creatively to the challenges posed by the Great Depression and the Nursing School Report to become national leaders in nursing education. Ms. Densford responded to the call from the Nursing School Report to transform the training of students in hospitals into a more robust educational preparation for professional practice. For example, she actively recruited quality faculty who brought with them innovative teaching strategies. Two faculty who she recruited from the Army School of Nursing, Ruth Johnson and Myrtle Hodgkins, were providing bedside instruction in hospitals for their nursing students. This teaching strategy differed from the practice of using hospital staff to oversee students. As a member of the faculty, Myrtle Hodgkins Co. began this clinical teaching method with students at Minneapolis General Hospital, which is now Hennepin County Medical Center. Students met with their instructor for orientation on this, their first morning on the medical service to discuss policies, methods, precautions, and techniques. Subsequently, students attended ward classes twice weekly to discuss patient care problems and answer questions. Another innovative practice introduced by the faculty was the concept of total patient care, where the nurse provided all of the care to a patient rather than the task-based functional practice of completing a single task, such as measuring blood pressures, for all the patients on the ward. Yet another innovation in the curriculum was the introduction of the case method in the early 30s by Deborah McClure Jensen, a new faculty member who authored two books on the subject. This case method was modeled after the strategy used in law schools. Nursing students were encouraged to discuss and analyze alternatives for patient care. In 1932, two faculty members, Barbara Thompson and Mabel Roach, published articles describing the case method of patient care and the handling of patient data using a device called a Cardex. The Cardex contained one card for each patient in a visible file showing the treatments and medications of a patient. The Cardex became a widespread convention that facilitated patient care data management in hospitals for the rest of the 20th century to be replaced in the 21st century by computerized systems. From the beginning, Densford advocated for better nursing education and employment practices. Densford responded to another committee recommendation by gradually reducing the student work hours in clinical practice from an original 48 hours to eventually 30 hours in order to reinforce the need for students to focus on their studies rather than staffing the hospital. Ms. Densford also advocated for the large number of nursing graduates unemployed due to the Depression. Minneapolis General Hospital was a key partner in nursing education. The superintendent of the hospital proposed that it and other affiliated hospitals advertise for students in order to increase the number of student care providers. Ms. Densford, just nine months into her tenure, protested that they should not continue to increase the enrollment in hospital schools of nursing when so many graduate nurses were unemployed. Rather, they should limit the enrollment, emphasizing the quality instead of the quantity of graduates. Nevertheless, medical school dean Lyon ruled that the superintendent should proceed to advertise for more nursing students for the hospital's diploma program. In protest, Ms. Densford submitted her resignation. Dean Lyon asked her to reconsider and come up with another solution to the problem. So Densford proposed what became known as the Learn and Earn Plan that was approved by all. After that, she withdrew her resignation. The Learn and Earn program allowed nurses with a diploma or nursing license to enter service in any of the hospitals associated with the university's programs as they worked to complete their baccalaureate degree. As a student, the nurse was assigned to 30 to 48 hours per week of clinical and administrative experience. In return, she received room, board, and laundry services plus an allowance of $10 per month. The university entered these students onto its roles, tuition-free. 
By successful completion of four quarters of university classes under this plan, students could earn 20 to 30 academic credits that could be applied toward a baccalaureate degree. Many of the nurses who took this opportunity did in fact go on to earn baccalaureate degrees. Some continued on until they earned master's degrees. In 1933, Densford, Lucille Petrie, and Phoebe Gordon launched the research mission of the school using Civil Works Administration grants. The Civil Works Administration grants are a federal program to ease the depression. The purposes of the research were to develop nursing knowledge as well as provide work for unemployed nurses. Studies ranged from sterilization of equipment to studies of the time needed to complete nursing procedures. Several faculty members also developed new procedures and published their ideas in the American Journal of Nursing. The innovation included things such as nasal catheter sectioning and creating medication carts. In addition to her work within the university, Catherine Densford strongly believed in the power of professional organizations to influence health at the local, national, and international level. In the 30s, her organizational responsibilities were primarily in the state of Minnesota. She increased the visibility of the School of Nursing by becoming a leader in numerous professional organizations, such as president of the Minnesota League for Nursing, chair of the Minneapolis Red Cross Committee, and president of the Minnesota Nurses Association. Ms. Densford supported efforts to recognize student scholarship by establishing a chapter of the National Nursing Honor Society, Sigma Theta Tau, now an international organization. The University of Minnesota was granted a charter in 1934 as Zeta Chapter, the sixth chapter. There were 26 charter members of Zeta Chapter. For a long time, there were problems with the housing arrangements for nurses at the University of Minnesota. Nursing students were housed in scattered, depressing, unsanitary residences about which the early nursing directors, Louisa Powell and Veneer, had complained. As soon as Catherine Densford arrived in Minnesota, she began to work actively for better nursing student housing. Prior to her arrival, the state legislature had appropriated money for improvement of living conditions for nursing students. But at the last moment, the School of Dentistry supporters succeeded in adding a rider to the bill that gave priority to building a new center for dentistry instead of housing for student nurses. To make room for the dentistry building, the university had to tear down several of the buildings where the nurses had lived. Into this crisis, the School of Nursing Alumni Association stepped up. The Committee of Nine was appointed to explore the possibility of getting action. Ms. Densford encouraged members of the committee to appear before the Joint Appropriations Committees of the Minnesota House and Senate in March 1931. At the hearing, legislators were surprised, stating, but we voted money for you two years ago. Alumna Mina Kiev proceeded to give them a brisk statement of what happened to the money and said, what we ask is new appropriation which will be available immediately. And it was granted almost immediately. The decision was helped by the fact that the Minnesota Employment Commission was standing by to urge that this would be a good chance to put unemployed men to work. Before the year was over, ground was broken and the building was ready by October of 1933. Paul Hall had room for 284 students and supervisors. Catherine Dansford actually lived on the seventh floor for several years. Paul Hall was st state of the art with facilities not common in other residence halls. It was connected to the hospital by a tunnel. The nurses hall was named and dedicated in October 1933. It was renamed for Louisa Paul in a ceremony in 1939 during the School of Nursing's 30th anniversary celebration. This change was the first time a university building had been named for a living person. So the first 30 years of the School of Nursing from 1909 to 1940 
demonstrated the evolving understanding of nursing education. Catherine Densford and the school's faculty met the challenge of societal change and aspirations for a broader foundation for practicing nurses. Increased coursework in the sciences and liberal arts were complemented with increasingly instructor-moderated clinical practice experience. The willingness to experiment led to a vigorous response to the needs of the nation and the challenges of the Great Depression.